first of all, I'm just going to whistle stop tour through um, some theology surrounding word and spirit, and I'm going to go through so fast. So I hope I'm clear. Um, but let's let's get going. And I want to address this question in perhaps a slightly different way to the way that you might think about it when you hear someone try and talk to you about how to be a church that holds up the word and the spirit in equal authority. So the first question I want to ask and the first way I want us to think about it is how do we know and experience God? We can't possess God. We can't put him in a box. We can't make him do things that we um, have rules or programs for. He's bigger. He's beyond that. He's greater. Um, yet we know that we can interact with him and we can expect him to reveal himself to us. And the reason that we know that is twofold. We know that Christ died for us to save us from fallen humanity, to restore us to right relationship with God. We know he died, he was, but first he was born, he lived a human life, then he died and was resurrected. He appeared to the women, to those on the road to Emmaus, to disciples and to Paul, and he promised that he would remain in the world, not in the world, but he would manifest himself to those who love him and that he was sending someone else but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, and he will teach you all things and bring you remembrance, it says in John. So we know that the Holy Spirit is part of the plan of salvation history. He is with all those who believe. Um, and Paul describes extensively in the epistles what he means by that. And then the second reason is that we know God reveals himself to us because we have the scriptures that they are able to make us wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And that all scripture is breathed out by God, as we know, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness that we find in 2 Timothy. So we know that the knowledge of God is entirely the gift of God and we receive it by faith. And I'm assuming that upon those two points, we agree. But as Morris says, it's the application of those two points that can cause some consternation and disagreement. So I'm going to attempt to lay out these difficulties in order to hopefully address them in the remainder of what I'm saying. So in my mind, these are the difficulties that you might have with trying to hold the word and the spirit equally in church life. So you might ask the question, if you have the Holy Spirit, are you still expected to exhibit the gifts of the spirit that Paul describes in the letters? And does that belief in the activities of the Holy Spirit that you hear charismatic Christians in particular describe result in some kind of diminishing of the authority of scripture? So can you have a blessed word brought by an individual that stands against and in contradiction to scripture? Or if all prophecy is foundational in scripture, then how can there be more of that type now that the canon is closed? Can Paul describe the church as being built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets? And that makes sense to us now. Some of you might have heard of the theologian Schleimacher, especially some of you on the continent. Can we have, do we end up running the risk of having a faith that's similar to the one that he described, one that pursues emotional individualism and that doesn't withstand a rationalist argument? And finally, you might say, does this mean scripture is insufficient? And do we need more than scripture in order to live a full Christian life? So I want to address those questions as I speak to you um, indirectly, perhaps, and sometimes more directly. And I want to try and combine biblical teaching with some thoughts um, and experiences and theological reflections from other people. So I want to tell you the answer, I think, to these questions from these three points that one, the word and the spirit are biblically and theologically coherent and are required for the full flourishing of the church. So this is based upon three points concerning charismata, um, which are historical, hermeneutical, and eschatological. Secondly, I want to say that worship is, with the biblical foundations of spiritual gifts and practices is embodied, um, and that helps us to fully participate in and orientate ourselves towards God. And thirdly, I want to have, make some practical comments and guidance and that will lead us into our question and answers. So the longest section is um, the one that we're gonna have to blast through. And that is that the word and the spirit are biblically and theologically coherent. I sense that many of us might find ourselves in the position where we are pragmatically cessationist 
or agnostic about the works of the Holy Spirit. By this I mean we find ourselves in a position where we read the Bible and its accounts of the early church and either believe it describes a church that used to have the Holy Spirit acting in its way, but no longer does because it's not needed anymore, which is a theological position, or that we simply don't practice it because we don't know how to, which is a pragmatic position. But I believe that neither of those two hold up to scrutiny. A church built upon foundations of the word and spirit is coherent and it is biblically informed. So we know that Luther called the church back to sola scripture, away from the practices that had dominated life until he spoke. And this means that the word is the final authority above all human institutions and inventions. The word is God's revelation of himself and it's the way that we know God offers to us his grace. Faith is not something that starts with us, but it's God's gift to us, for us and is expounded in his word. And this means that all error is corrected by drawing back to scripture and all truth is revealed to us in that way. Our practice, our theology and our ideas, our experience should all be drawn back and considered in the light of what God reveals about himself and others in scripture. So this is a good place actually to start talking about the spirit. What does scripture itself say about the actions of the Holy Spirit? And the way I'm going to argue this is actually based on a book by a chap from our group of churches, the wider group from New Frontiers, and his name's Andrew Wilson. So can I recommend to you that book and it's called The Spirit and the Sacrament. So his argument is divided into three and he begins with a hermeneutical argument, which is of course based on scripture. So we asked um, at the beginning, how do we know God? And this is a question of epistemology about how we know things. There are different epistemologies for different things, um, but God is unique. And so we cannot know him in the same ways that we know other things. Yet he has given us a way of knowing him, and that is by coming to faith as individuals and joining the family of God the church. Those people who join the church are united, says Paul, by encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, and participation in the spirit, which is in Philippians 2. Not only is the church unified and together as individuals, they are called to be one body, and they as a body participate in the spirit. So we would ask, what is that participation? Well, Paul says in Corinthians, it is the exhibition of different gifts from the spirit. And in Romans 12, he says there are varieties of gift, but the same spirit. And each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So we've arrived at our first hermeneutical point, which is that we know God via the spirit because the Bible says we do. Paul says that we should eagerly desire the higher gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. He also says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good. And Wilson writes in his book, given the clarity and the frequency of this apostolic instruction, and given that we would normally assume that New Testament imperatives apply to us unless it's clear from the context that they don't, Charismatics believe that the burden of proofs rests with those who says Paul's instructions don't apply to us rather than those who say they do. So that is to simply say the Bible says it and there's no convincing argument to say that that's wrong. The scriptures are clear. These gifts are not just for the individual in isolation, but are for the good of the church. It's also clear that they are to be tested and for us, that's against the revealed word of God in scripture. The gifts of the spirit are spoken about in scripture as normative for the community in Christ. They're different for different people at different times, but what they are, are expected. And we should be seeking that expression of those gifts as part of a healthy um, outworking in the church. So that was our hermeneutical point. And now we can move on to the historical and the historical point deals with a question that people say that the gifts of the spirit had gone now that the time of the um, apostles are over. But we can look back into historical records and see that even the earliest Christians experienced the gifts of the, of, um, the spirit. So even Augustine, who some of you might know as a cessationist, is actually only a cessationist about the gifts of languages gifts of tongues in other things he spoke extensively about miracles and healings justin martyr guess what happened to him writes about 
prophetic gifts being current to him. Irenaeus refers to contemporary gifts. And Origen, quiz at the end, who knows what happened to Origen, writes this. There are still preserved among Christians traces of the Holy Spirit, which appeared in the form of a dove. They expel evil spirits and perform many cures and foresee certain events according to the will of the Logos. Basil the Great, who helped us write some of the great um, creeds, said, the spirit enlightens all, inspires prophets, gives wisdom to lawmakers, consecrate priests, empowers kings, perfects the just, exalts the prudent, is in active in gifts of healing, gives life to the dead, frees those in bondage, turns foreigners into adopted sons. So even he, who is writing some dense theological treaties, can say he saw the spirit give life to the dead. Cyril of Jerusalem, who was a good theologian and an unpleasant chap, wrote, he employs the tongue of one man for wisdom, the soul of another he enlightens by prophecy, and to another he gives power to drive away devils. So that's our historical argument that right from the beginning of the church, after the close of the canon, we still saw evidence that the spirit was working. And finally, my third point in this first section, keep up if you can, um, is eschatological. The apostles in scripture saw the gifts as being part of a now and not yet a realised and future eschatological situation. You may have heard of the chap called Coleman's analogy that the church today lives between D-Day and V-E Day. And the idea is that we are now but not yet. The kingdom of God is becoming but not finished. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that the gifts will cease but not until the new kingdom is fully realised. Please let me encourage you, we can have a positive eschatology. We're not living in a dystopian teen film where it all goes wrong and people start behaving very badly and paint their faces funny colours. We're not in that place. Our eschatological situation can be positive. It can be optimistic. God's kingdom is going to be fully realised eventually, but as we wait and as it is not fully realised yet, we see that God works through the faithful who are enabled via the Holy Spirit. So we return again to that question, how do we know God? The church works together to construct that knowledge with checks and balances so that that knowledge is not departed from. So I would like to say that we know God in a way that is pneumatological, and by that I mean it is based in the Holy Spirit. The spirit works in the local incarnation of church. The understanding of the revelation of God, the body of Christ does that together. It possesses the scriptures who are given to us by the spirit and helps us interpret it. Not in a relativistic sense, but by using the scriptures as a plumb line by which activities in the church, including those of the Holy Spirit are discerned. Right, I'm going to gallop through the next few things um, until we get to our questions. So I've mentioned before about embodied worship, and this is an area that my um, PhD particularly focuses on, so I'm quite um, keen on it, um, and I would encourage you to learn more about it if you can. So many of the types of charismatic worship are active and they are interactive. They involve bodies, they don't just involve our minds. But as we live, we suffer from an inheritance from the Enlightenment. And we need to fully understand that what we live in today, and that inheritance is rationalism. That means that we put a lot of emphasis on what we know and what we can understand. I've already done that, I've explained things to us now. But what I want to say is that there are more ways of knowing than just knowing it in your brain. Seeking a knowledge of God that is entirely found in our minds as we are inclined to forgets an important part of our created self, our bodies. Our worship and our knowledge of God should be embodied. Much of what we know in our lives, in our day-to-day -day experience comes from our habits. If you've got children, you might realize if you do something twice, you're doomed to do it forever. If I give my children a piece of cake at 11 o'clock in the morning one day, they're going to want it at 11 o'clock in the morning every day forever. Part of that is trying to see what they can get away with. Part of it is that they become embodied and ritualised very quickly. A chap called James K.A. Smith writes in a book that I would like to recommend to you called You Are What You Love about repeated behaviours 
he says that all activities that we do, often subconscious, are orientated towards a telos, towards an end. Many of these gifts of the spirit, I want to say, are similarly orientating. There are embodied gifts that uses our bodies in order to orientate us towards God. Now, Smith gives us a really good example. He talks about a shopping center. And now he's an American, so he's writing about one of those great big American malls. And he says that shopping centers for, function like temples that orientate you towards the good of consumerism, as is conceived by the shopping center owners. And you have your priests who offer you up ways to worship consumerism in the form of purchasing your offerings. And you go into these beautifully decorated worship spaces. And he goes on and on in this metaphor about how a shopping center functions to orientate us. And I want to say that spiritual gifts, the gifts that we read about in scripture, are embodied ways of orientating us towards God. If we lift our hands in worship, which we'll commonly see in charismatic churches, we are told by our posture and our stance that we are submitted to God. By uttering a prophetic word to another person, we orientate ourselves towards hearing from God and gifting it to other people. And you may be able to find this similarity in other things that we all agree upon. Taking the bread and the wine and being baptised. Both are, amongst many other things, embodied worship practices. So we can say are the gifts of the spirit. And so finally, I want us to concentrate just for a little bit of time on the idea that poor theology can lead to poor practice. Some of you may have been in that experience where you have been seen things or heard about things that have happened and that have left you concerned, especially you might say in the prosperity gospel that we sometimes hear about and we might have even experienced um, and we say that this is not good but it does not mean that we want to steer away from all gifts and all works of the spirit in fear we must not let fear dominate our, our thinking about this and we must not let hurt prevent us from fully experiencing what God has for us confidence and openness for, caused by theological conviction can lead us to that freedom and a full experience of God working in his spirit in the church. So we must remember that the way to avoid that hurt and that pain of poor practice is to test the gifts of the spirit, not via suspicious um, behaviours, but in love. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. I'd like to think if someone tried it in your church, you'd spot it pretty quick. But there will be other things that take slightly more discerning attitude. But what Paul is saying is there is a way of discerning what we see and knowing that it is from God. The work of the Spirit is commensurate with the revelation of God in Scripture. We must test these things against the plumb line of Scripture. If they are found wanting, then we must disregard them and bring gentle correction. However, we should also remember that not all new things are wrong because they are novel and not all old things are wrong because they are old. The spirit can work in ways that we might initially think are dead. Empty rituals are only empty if the spirit is not in them. Some of my own personal most profound experiences of God have been through dry liturgical practice that many, many of us might not want to take part in. But liturgy, and I'm circling back round to my favourite topic, is an embodied action that draws us to God in the same way as many other embodied actions do. Similarly, and Mike will always say this, a new idea or a new expression of worship of God can be good and should not be feared because we are unfamiliar with it. We must embrace it, understand it, and draw it alongside scripture to test it. So I'm coming into land now, and these are my three points that I've made that I hope you have followed me through with. Number one, that the combination of the Holy Spirit and the word of God in action in the body of Christ, the church, is theologically coherent and it is correct. Number two, that we are embodied creatures who know God through the actions of the spirit in our bodies. And finally, number three, the practice matters. If it is wrong, scripture corrects it. 
If it is new or old, it's worthy of consideration as it might be a new expression and it might be the gift of the spirit. And that that brings freedom, freedom for us to encounter God in ways that are exciting, holding the scripture as our plumb line to test it all.